May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Good morning, good morning, St. James. It is always a delight to be back home, my home away from home, and a real delight that it is not so hot today. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> we love a break. I don't, I have to confess, I don't know all the issues facing our church at our general convention, but I did. I have been paying attention to the election of our new presiding bishop-elect, Bishop Sean Rowe, and the surrounding questions for each of the candidates surrounding the state of our church and the health of our church. It was interesting, each of the candidates had a biblical character. I believe he and someone else had the woman of the well as a model. I agree with my brother and friend, Stephen Balky, that I truly believe the church will be in good hands with Bishop Rowe. As I listened to each of the candidates' brief sermons on the call of a presiding bishop and the state of the church, I couldn't help but think of today's gospel characters. One of my favorites, the woman with the issue of blood, and a new favorite, Jairus and his daughter, 12-year-old daughter. I love, love, love this story in the Gospel of Mark. And I usually have a habit of just zeroing in on this poor woman suffering for 12 years and unnamed, only known by her health. I was happy at the General Convention many years ago, I did pay attention to that one, where they decided that we should be using the Revised Common Lectionary because in the past, this story would get cut short and we would only get Jairus, heal, Jairus and a daughter healing, silencing this woman even further. It's a long story. I understand why they cut it out and divided it, but I believe the whole story is important just as Mark gives it to us. Mark has a habit of sandwiching one story inside of another. And today he sandwiches this story into the story of Jairus and his little girl. Each of the characters, I think, is on an important journey of faith. Jesus is notorious in Mark also for crossing boundaries, going to places, unwelcome places, going wherever, and people following him are crossing boundaries also. Maybe Mark's pattern of including stories inside of another one is his way of telling us it's only one story. It's not multiple stories, we are all connected. The people who take a chance are turned around and blessed. I believe it is so important to us as our bishops have suggested, we, if we are to go forward at all, we gotta listen to everybody. Not just the privileged stories, all of them. Mark brings those stories together in stories of controversy, healing, and in miracles. In this story today, Mark brings together two daughters, the daughter of Jairus, the leader of a synagogue, and this poor estranged daughter who has to go around saying she is unclean. She has practiced being invisible. For anyone who bumps into her, they are unclean. So she has to navigate society, avoiding contact, but she's on her way to Jesus, bless the Lord. Jairus and his 12-year-old daughter come from a world of privilege. The woman with the hemorrhage is similar to the lepers. She is poor, she is impoverished, she has spent all that she had on doctors, bless her heart. And it's more than just money. She has spent all of her hope, all of her ambitions, all of her plans are nullified with this condition, which the word today says it has worsened. Imagine her emotional state, dealing with this for 12 years. I think it is brilliant that Mark suspends this wonderful story of Jairus and his daughter and brings this other story to the side and sneaks it in. In doing this, Mark makes Jairus wait. I know you got privileges, I know you're used to things happening fast, but you gotta wait. Let me take care of this woman. This woman is teaching us an important lesson. 
Faith is so necessary. She's one of the few people in scripture where Jesus says, your faith has healed you. Faith. After that, Jesus tells Jairus, do not fear, only believe, have faith. Jesus wants to develop our faith as we as a church move into the future. This woman who has been hemorrhaging for 12 years is probably unable to have children. Yet she is interestingly linked to this 12-year-old girl who is at the point of death, and she too will not have any children. Imagine her pain began when this girl was born. They are linked. Even though they are daughters of different social location, they are now sisters who represent all of Israel. That number 12 is very important. So I imagine in the original context, Jesus has given a story to Israel what does your future look like if you don't include this woman and this girl? Are they the ones hemorrhaging and dying? Are we the ones hemorrhaging and dying? What if Mark is telling us that the healing of privileged bodies is intricately connected to the bodies of the poor? What if our healing, what if our restoration depended on the healing and restoration of the poor? What if the stories of the marginalized turn out to be the very stories that we need to hear to bring our church back to its fullest potential? Wouldn't that be something? As this is also Pride Sunday, I'm so glad to hear the Methodist Church are working towards full inclusion of including all in ordination process and membership. I am so proud of our church that we have made progress there. However, we have work to do as our transgender community reminds us. And we still have work to do to include all people of color, but we've come a long way. What do we do with these stories? What do we do with Jairus and this bleeding woman? I think we learn from them. I think we look at their model of faith. As I've said, Jairus is a man of privilege who probably could have sent anybody to go summon Jesus for him, but it's this little girl. He probably came with tears and fell at his feet and begged him, heal my daughter. How can the church be a place for the healing for our youth of future generations? And I again ask, what do we do with the poor? I think the solution is not to overlook them, but to include and sneak them into our narrative as Mark does. I believe we're called to reread all stories, all lives, and embrace all of them on some level. We have the capacity to manage and read multiple texts. I think we, like the Gospel of Mark, should sandwich the stories into the larger narrative, which may reveal how we're going to make it through this. But we can't be healed if we don't confront the truth about our condition, like this courageous, faithful woman who had exhausted all of her resources. I really, really, really love this woman. She acknowledged that she has a health condition. So often we pretend that we don't, personally and as an institution. I know times when I've been in pain, I'll go to the doctor and say, oh, I'm not in that much pain. Oh, it's not that bad not telling the truth. Sometimes we ignore symptoms or hide them or just don't want to deal with them. I had a friend years ago who was diagnosed with AIDS and did not receive treatment. And as he got sick, he said, oh, I forgot all about it. I didn't even know I had it. It's easy to do. We don't want to confront the painful truth. Or we think that it's just going to get better on its own. You know, bodies heal. If you just wait, it's going to get better in the morning. Jairus, too, made bold statements of faith as well. Jairus and this woman, though, didn't just stay with the situation. They sought a solution. Concerning the woman, the gospel says she had heard about Jesus. Isn't that a great line? She had heard about Jesus. How are people today going to hear about Jesus if we don't go out and tell them? 
I think Bishop Rowe is right that the days of just sitting and waiting for people to come in on their own are over. Perhaps that's different for us at St. James because it's a beautiful space and people do want to see and come inside. But many of our churches, we have to go out and tell and invite them in. What does she do next? She steps out in faith. And Jesus says, you're stepping out. You're stepping out in faith has healed you. And he converts her identity. She's no longer known as the woman who's bleeding all over the place. She's known as a daughter of Israel. Do we have the faith within us to heal this institution and develop a new identity? I believe we do. Jairus' faith is rocked when he hears that his daughter is now dead. He's standing there, man, I've been waiting on this man. He's going around healing other people, and now my girl is dead. Whose faith wouldn't be rocked to the core? But Jesus says something very, very important to him too. Do not fear, only believe. Do not fear, Jairus. Only believe. I'm still going to go to your house. Give me your address. Let me put it in my phone. I'm going to go to visit you. Faith is usually juxtaposed with doubt. But Jesus acknowledges that fear is also involved, and we have to push that aside. Martin Luther King was fond of saying that fear knocked on the door, faith opened it, and fear was gone. Jesus told Jairus, don't confuse the truth with the facts. Did you hear me? Don't confuse the truth with the facts. The facts may present themselves as a dismal picture, but the truth is I am Jesus. I will turn this around. I will turn your life around. I will turn your situation around. I will turn your health around. I will turn this church around. If you dare, believe and have faith and not fear. And the last part of the story is my absolute favorite. Jesus puts people out of the house. It ain't even his house. And he put them out. He only took Peter, James, and John with them to the house and allowed no one from the crowd to come and follow him. And once he gets to Jairus' house, he has to put out those professional mourners. Can you imagine people hired to mourn and weep and wail. They were brought in to help Jairus. And when Jesus questioned them, what are y'all doing? Their tears, it says, it turned to laughter. They're laughing at Jesus. So he has to put them out too. And just keeps her mother and father and the disciples. How many of us know when God gives you a vision, when God gives you a calling, when God gives you something to do, you don't spend a whole lot of time with people who don't support that or bring their negativity. You plan on doing what? How much money you got? How are you going to do that with that? You are too old to be thinking about doing something like that. You need to check yourself. Jesus says, put them out of your house. Get them out. Jesus is able to then heal and restore the little girl, just like he did the big girl. Mark tells us that no story is unimportant. Every story, every life matters. And no one is too far gone if they still have breath within them. Jesus can turn it around. When I was a social worker for many years, I loved, loved, loved those social work groups that I would run for girls, junior high school girls, who have been victims of sexual abuse. So I take the health and welfare of women very, very seriously. And speaking of women and healthcare, on a lighter note, I read this delightful story of this woman and I identify with her as well. She went to the doctor for her annual physical. The nurse asked her, okay ma'am, how much do you weigh? Do you know how much you weigh? She said, yeah, I weigh about 115, 120 pounds. She goes, okay, let's be sure. Step on the scale. Uh, Ma'am, you weigh 170 pounds. She then says, do you know how tall you are? She goes, yes, I'm 5'7". She goes, okay, ma'am, take off your shoes and stand against the wall. Let me measure you. Ma'am, you're 5'5". 
The nurse then checked her blood pressure, and she said, I'm afraid to tell you, but your blood pressure is up. And the woman snapped, of course my blood pressure is up. I came in here a tall, slim woman, and thanks to you, I'm now short and fat. <laughs> Sometimes the story we tell ourselves and the things we attempt to hide and leave out gang up on us and put us at risk for poor health. Lord, we pray that you restore our faith, restore our communion, communities in our communion, and bring us to wholeness and to that unity of spirit that our colleague declares. And please, please grant us thy salvation. <laughs>